Everybody good? Yeah. Alright, so I'm here to sort of uh, tell you guys how I get got to become who I am and what I do. Uh, I can't really tell you how to do something that you probably want to do. It might be something completely different to what I've done. I can only tell you about what I know. What I know is that um, I slaved in the beginning to try and become a commercial product. I wanted to be on the radio and on the TV. I wanted to be on the TV growing up. That's what I wanted. I wanted to badly be famous and rich and be all of that stuff. And then later on, as I kept on trying to create products with my music and to try and market myself to these labels to try and be part of these record labels and to try and go on tour and, and play with all these amazing people, I realized how hard it really was and how much they didn't really give a shit. They, they were more interested and concerned in finding people that they could pretty much manipulate to do exactly what they want. They want to find someone who's ridiculously good looking, who's got a nice voice, and then they can just say, sing that, wear that, and that's what you're going to do. And at first I thought, yeah, I'm cool with that. As long as I make loads of money and I get loads of checks, it's all good, right? <laughs> but as I grew up and I started to get more uh, sort of, I guess, interested in the art of music, I realized that that's not going to happen. I'm not, I have to make it myself in some way or another. So I played in as many different bands as I could and got like the biggest, broadest picture of music as I, like all the music that I enjoyed anyway. I tried to fill my brain with as much as I could. So I, I'd been jamming, I was jamming with a heavy metal band for like seven years I, uh, from when I left school till I was like 23 years old. At the same time, I was also jamming with jazz musicians, and uh, just which was completely the opposite world. Because in the metal world, everything's about sections and 16 bars of this, 16 bars of that, and then going to this, and then there's that, and then this, and back to that again. And um, whereas in the jazz world, trying to get any jazz musician to repeat the same thing twice is pretty much impossible <laughs> if they're good at what they do. Obviously. So um, yeah. Having that completely different, that polar opposite effect just kind of filled my brain with new ideas. And around the same time I got involved, I started uh, going out to raves and checking out dance music and getting, seeing that scene. And so I was in hip hop bands, I was in reggae bands, I was in funk bands, I was dip jamming with DJs. I just immersed myself as much as I could growing up from basically 17 to 23 years old. Got as many gigs as I could and thought that one day I'll become this commercial product that I could sort of market myself to the world. And then it was all, it kind of hit me with a ton of bricks that, you know, it wasn't going to happen, like I said before. So what I did was I decided, rather than waiting around for the opportunities to come to me, um, I felt like I'd sort of paid my dues musically, like I'd experimented enough. I'd already been playing around with an effects pedal just like this one. It was the GT6, two models below it. And that's what I was playing in the bands. I thought, I'm not a great singer. But these bands on, like, the, I went and saw these bands, I heard their albums and they were awesome, and then I go and see them show, the live show, and it wasn't, some of them weren't as good. I realized the singers weren't as great as they were live, as they were on albums sometimes. And I was like, why is that? It's because on the records, they've got producers, they've got effects, they've got compression, reverb, they've got all these things that make their voice sound good. And I was like, I can make myself sound better. <laughs> I don't need to be that good at singing. So what I did was I bought a pedal, which originally I bought for guitar, because I'm like, I can't play guitar very well, so I call them talent pedals. <laughs> so I started playing with that, and then I started putting a microphone in, and obviously the first time I did it, it didn't come out very, it sounded very good. There was lots of feedback and noise, and the guys in the band, Cade was in that band, just over there, he's my manager now. He was like, turn that shit off. I never plug that in again. And, um, well, I didn't listen to him, obviously. I kept doing it, which is good, good thing. And I learned how to basically put effects over my voice and how to make my voice sound the way I wanted it to sound in my head, the way I heard it, how to do it live. And so by adding delays and reverbs and compression and things like that, I learned basically how to sound just like I'm in the studio. So doing that through all the different bands gave me a broad understanding of my place in the mix, how I should sound. I'm just going to turn that down a little bit. Is that all right if I don't use the mic? Yeah. Yeah, 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 sounds good. Um, so yeah, so learning how to put myself in the mix, that's what my big thing about jazz musicians. Anyone who learns jazz learns that depending on the musicians you're with and depending on the room you're playing in, your playing style changes, you adapt to your surroundings. Because you, you don't, you're not there, to, you don't just rock up and say, this is what I know and I'm going to play that. Which is what we did in the metal band and obviously sometimes it just you're in a tiny room and the PA doesn't sound very good and you sound like shit. So with jazz musicians, you know, you, you get in there and you just set up, the room sounds a certain way, I'm going to play in this style too because 
you're just constantly aware of the acoustics and your place in the mix. And so this pedal had a lot to do with me understanding that and how I can take things to the next level. Later on, I saw this guy using a loop station, this guy called Mal Webb, an Australian vocalist, this freak of nature, this guy, he can make the weirdest noises with his mouth, things that I don't believe are actually humanly possible, but he does it, so they are. But anyway, I saw him doing, it was just like, no effects, just a loop station and his microphone. And he built up these ridiculous soundscapes and sounds, and he was beatboxing, and he was looping, and he was putting these sounds into these bass lines, and it was, it was just really freaky to see someone actually do that. These sounds come out of their face and into the microphone and be looped. And it's so transparent as well. You watch him and you see him make the sound and then it comes back and then loop. And I was just infatuated with this concept. And I remember thinking, man, I've got this effects pedal which can do all these other things that you know he can't do. I can't do the things he can do, but I can do these other things. What if I just take the concept of the loop station and I could beatbox a little bit as well. I learned throughout that during school. And I thought, oh, maybe I could just kind of do this thing. And kind of, I had this idea in my brain, this concept. And every day at school, I remember drawing a picture of <coughs> what I wanted my live busking setup to be. Because I knew I was going to be a street performer as well. I had this in my, since I was like 14, watching street performers, doing magic shows, doing mime stuff, whatever. I always wanted to do it. So I used to, I used to write in my little journal, like, what I had the setup and what I was going to do and how I was just constantly crafting my brain, manifesting the situation, constantly thinking about it. And then uh, when I hit about 23, and the band, I recorded an album with this band, the metal band, um, and that looked like it was going to go places, and I felt like I wanted to go to Europe and shot that around, and at the same time travel around and street perform to sort of pay my way, just so I could move around Europe, get a scope for the scene, and see maybe where we could launch this band, because we had this product that we'd be preparing. Even though I was already, already sort of coming to terms with the fact that it might not actually happen, I still had this kind of dream to make it happen with these guys who we spent so long making music together. So I went to Europe and I bought this whole system, this idea that I wanted, that I'd been drawing in my notebook the whole time. It was like a little gel battery. So the thing, the reason you get a gel battery, a 12 volt gel battery, is because car batteries, although they can provide power, uh, they provide a lot of power really quickly. Great for starting an engine, but not great if you want to power a sound system. So gel batteries are much better for that. They release slow amounts of energy, but the same sort of wattage. So I have a 110 amp hour gel battery, 12 volts, with an inverter plugged in. And then the plug-in, the, the inverter is what converts 12 volts to 110, in your case, to 20 in Europe. So I just have you have to count up all the different things. So this is about 60 watts. The sound system here looks to me would be around about, I don't know, the, the subs are about 200, and those are probably about 60, so three. 20 or 350, so about 400, 500 watts, and you could have this whole setup on the street with an inverter. A 500 watt inverter is probably about 60 bucks. Run enough one battery. Run enough one battery. How many hours did you get? It depends how many, how, how much amp power you've got in the battery. So if you've got 110 amp power, which is the one I use, about six, seven, I used to have an 800 watt inverter and 110 amp power, and that would last about four hours. But the louder you go, the more it's going to drain. The, let the quieter you go, the less it drains, so you can go longer. So basically the old trick is when you run out of power, you just turn it down a little bit and you keep going. For <laughs> or if you feel really tired and the battery doesn't seem to be running out, you just crank it. And either the cops shut you down or you run out of power, either way it's ending. <laughs> so anyway, so I did that, I, got in, I bought a van and um, I met my lady, the Flower Fairy, and Kate also came and joined me for a bit of the, the leg as did a few other friends, and basically we just went out and we street performed in as many major cities around Europe as we could with this little setup. I mean, I was making the music, those guys were looking after me and selling my CDs, and you wouldn't believe how much money you can make street performing. Like, people still freak out on that time today. It's not about the money in the hat. That's sort of like, you know, chum change. You can make, okay, you can make a good 60, 70 dollars in a few hours, which is yeah, pretty good compared to like a normal desk job, right? You're just sitting there asking for money for playing a song or whatever like that. Beggars make you for more money actually, which is really bad. <laughs> <laughs> Selling CDs on the other hand, we had a, we basically lived in this van, we had all our equipment in there, had a solar panel on the roof, and we had this CD stacker which could stack six CDs and burn six CDs at once. And we would just sit there and play cards and you know, have <laughs> and make some food or whatever and just burn hundreds of CDs every day and we would 
put them right down, my, it was back down to MySpace, right? So we put the MySpace address, email address, <laughs> phone number in case they wanted to book us on these burnt CDs and we just go out hit the streets and sell roughly, a, an all right day would have been 50 CDs in like an hour and a half, two hours. That's, that's an all right day. And then on amazing days, you know, 150 CDs. Selling for 10 bucks each, you do the math. It's, you know, we were, we were banking quite a lot. We didn't save really any of it. <laughs> we just, that was the way we decided to do it. We thought, like, we're here to travel, we're here to have a great time. We don't want to just miss out on all the cool things. Like, we want to go and see the Madame de Swords thing and Ash there. We want to go and see that uh, Van Gogh Museum. We want to go and eat at that awesome gastronomy restaurant. And, you know, we didn't hold it back. We just spent every penny that we made. But at the same time, luckily, because I'd spent so long crafting my ideas and my music and my sound before I started street performing. And when I started street performing, I was practicing on the move, under pressure, to people who were there and they were instantly giving me uh, feedback right there and then. If they didn't like it, they walked away. If they didn't like it, they bought a CD. And rather than trying to make myself a product for a record label, I learned what was connecting myself to the people who actually are the ones who are going to buy a CD in the first place. And learning what they enjoy is one of the most important things, I think. I mean, it's not, you're not a slave to what they believe. You've still got to do what you like. But you can do what you like and work out what everybody likes at the same time. And that's kind of my, been my journey this entire time. And I'm still learning what I can do and what I can't do and how to make things good. So, yeah, we would basically just travel around, go from city to city, and just street perform as much as we could until we got kicked out or until, you know, we rinsed it and there was no one else left to buy a city. <coughs> And uh, I remember the first year that we did that, we cal I calculated that I sold 25,000 CDs in, in the summer. And, and I was like, man, that's more than a lot of labels like are selling for independent bands and the bands that are getting put out there. And that was, that was in rainy conditions sometimes. It was like, you know, it was, it was pretty tough. It was really tough, actually. But the first year, I was like, wow, that's amazing. So I went back to Australia because uh, it was, you can't, Obviously, street perform in winter in Europe because it's snows and shit. So, went back to Australia and I bought it. I, I sold all my equipment, went back to Australia, I bought a new van and bought the same equipment again, or I, I upgraded some of my stuff and toured up the coast of Australia and did that. And again, sold like a good 15,000 CDs or so around that summer. Came back to Europe armed with even more tunes, with better ideas, more sounds. But I'd learned, or after a year of doing that, I learned what is it that stops a crowd. And I can tell you straight away, I, I can break it down pretty easily. Like if you want to have a hit tune, not necessarily a hit tune, but you want to have a way of making people listen to what you've got to say, there are, I think there are about three or four elements that are necessities in your music. The first one is everybody likes a nice fat drum break. <laughs> right? We're at a, a generation point. I mean, you don't have to have that in your music, but when you're walking down the street and you hear someone strumming uh, like on a guitar singing Oasis over there or some dude doing that fat hip hop break, you're going to go listen to that. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's something new and different on the street. So a big fat heavy break people like. People really like bass frequencies. Yeah. That's something that people, especially in the UK, people respond to loads. So a big fat bass line, a melodic bass line, something really nice. People also want to hear conscious lyrics. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's one thing. It, it, okay, it, it's one thing to be on MTV and talk about how many bitches you've got, but when you're out in the street and you haven't got any bitches with you, doesn't <laughs> <laughs> work. Yeah. MTV, you can, you can prove that you've got it all because they're all hanging out. It's not the same thing. Exactly, right. and everyone knows it's all bullshit. <laughs> so it's like you've got to just talk about what makes sense to you, and that's all I've ever done. Is I I don't know how to make my lyrics all like uh, metaphorical and shit. I don't really do that sort of stuff. I've never been good at it. I'm not very good at articulating my words in general, actually. So when it comes to writing lyrics, I just write simple things. And as long as you're saying with heart and you're singing with conviction, that's the only thing that really is going to stop people and make them want to listen to. I wrote the song, the song that's kind of blown up for me, which has kind of made me popular is the song called Love Someone. Love Someone. And that one there, I wrote it on guitar and I sung it to that band, the metal band, and they said it 
gay as big as shit. <laughs> was like, don't ever sing that again. And I'm like, why? Like, you can't be singing about that shit. Like, why? And they're like, because I was there on Saturday night when you stuck a ten dollar bill up your ass. And I'm like, you can't. You haven't got that in. I used to do that kind of dumb shit. <laughs> um, yeah, I was a dickhead, obviously. So. Hey, you guys are gay. Okay. Sorry, I don't mean it. Mean it in that disrespect. Absolutely no. You're right. Um. Yeah, so, anyway. He was saying it in context, though. It was, it was what he's being called. He wasn't actually saying it. Amen. Yeah, I, well, but I did use the word, so yes. yeah, I apologize. Anyway, so, uh, back to what I was saying. I learned very quickly when I started street performing that uh, singing, singing with heart and with conviction is the only way to turn people's heads. And I truly do believe the lyrics that I was saying when I sang Love Someone the first time when they told me it was bad. But... <laughs> I wasn't singing it with the same conviction as I did with it when, I was, when I was on the street, when I was really struggling. I was living in a van and I was going back to my van by myself or with my lady or whatever. And we would cook our little meal and then go out the next day in the cold and set up our equipment and just do it and live it. And all of a sudden the lyrics that I'd written before started having more meaning to me. And that's when I sang them, the more emphasis and the more meaning I put into these lyrics when I sang them, the more people bought the CDs. And they wanted to hear that song. They wanted to have it on the, on the radio, on, the, on their CD player. And then, I, by about three, after three years of learning this and just putting as much effort into my music in that moment as I could, someone in England came up to me and said, "I want to film you." As did many other people came up and said that as well. And I was a bit like, "Yeah, yeah, cool, whatever. Come down, bring your camera. I'll just record it," as I always did. And this one particular day, I sang the song. Uh, he filmed it. I was actually, I remember the day when he filmed "Love Someone." Uh, on the street, I was actually a little bit annoyed that he was there because people were thinking that I was there to film a video, mm -hmm. so people weren't stopping to watch and to buy my CD. So I, I'm like, man, I need to sell some CDs. <laughs> that's how I made my money, right? That's how I. So I was just like, God, oh, wish we'd just leave. <clears throat> anyway, so he, he filmed. So there was that kind of energy was in there as well. It was kind of weird. And did the song, I did the day, and he didn't. I didn't hear back from him for about two weeks, and then I was. He calls me back, and he's like, Oh, have you got the the recording from that day? And no other video that had ever gone on YouTube with my music had ever been, had the audio straight out of the pedals. Mm. It was always just from someone's camera phone. Yeah. And you know, that, shit, that stuff doesn't really go viral. It's not, it doesn't sound very good. You can show it for a few people, it's like, yeah, it sounds kind of cool, I say it like. Anyway, I, I mastered this, the audio track, I didn't change it, anything, I just took the audio, I mastered it, made it a little bit fatter, and just gave it to him, he stuck it on. And within a week, it went up to like 5,000 views. Which I was kind of impressed with at the time. It's still, it's still kind of alright to get that many views, but I was, I didn't think much of it. What I realised that happened was, all these people over the last that, the three years before that had bought my CD. They were waiting for something else to pop up because they'd seen me on the street. They connected with me. I sold them my music there and then. They connected with me and I spoke to them, and they enjoyed the music. And they went away and they've been waiting and waiting and waiting. And all of a sudden, this video pops up. Oh, that's that dude I saw. And they showed as many people as they could. And it just grew and grew and grew. And it just sort of, the groundwork that I'd spent on the street came together. If I had have just released that video without doing all that groundwork, I don't believe I'd be standing here talking to you guys right now. It wouldn't have happened that way. What did happen, which was crazy, was somehow out of that energy that was happening on YouTube and Facebook and all the sharing and the commenting, somehow it happens in the Ukraine, in Eastern Europe, right? A place I'd never thought I'd ever go to. I'd never even read, I sort of knew about it. I get this email, hey, I'd love you to come to do a show. We've got this club. We can pay 300 euro. I'm like, I'll do that. I'll go to Ukraine for 300 euro. Like, I mean, promoters in England were offering me 100, euro, 100 pounds to do a show. I was making 1,000 on the streets. So I always said no. I, I, my, I kind of said to myself, if they can offer me as much as I'd make in the street, then I'll come and do your show. Otherwise, screw you. <laughs> and it's like, you know, I, I'd go to the nights and have fun, but I'm not going to go and sweat on stage and go have go hard and, and just ruin my voice so that the next day I can't go on street perform on a beautiful Sunday afternoon in the street to all these people that are actually my audience anyway. So I get flown to Ukraine to do this show, and it was the craziest experience of my life because every single person in that club, that, that, the promoter, what he did was he took my video and he sent it through his channel of Ukrainian dance culture people. And the people over there are so in tune with social networking. You've got no idea. Like, 
Western world here, Australia, America, we are so spoon-fed by the, 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 ma the media, the, the mass media, that we, we don't really, we're so desensitized to looking for things ourselves. Like, we think we do. We, oh, yeah, I, 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 I like my underground bands. No. We don't realize what it's like. In Eastern Europe, they've been bootlegging since the USSR days. They, they, you know, like, it's been... It's yeah, it's in there. It's in their culture to try and find things. So as soon as the internet exploded there, like, they, the kids are so savvy. They, they know what they like. They know what they're looking for. They know how somehow where to find it. Anyway, this promoter put my uh, music on this channel and it just kind of exploded in the Ukraine. And I literally went from having 5,000 views to 15,000 views in a couple of days. And it was all, I looked up on YouTube, it was all in the Ukraine. <laughs> so I get to the Ukraine and it's like Elvis is in the building. <laughs> and I'm going from a street, street performing and like, you know, selling CDs like casually on the street to get walking up to a, the first ever show, it was just WFX on the bill and a room this big packed of people singing along to my music which was just yeah. the most yeah. incredible experience I, I remember having at that time especially wow. even now I mean it was the first time that really happened to me and I was like wow something's really actually going to happen now I feel like I, I've, I'm on this electrical vibe that's just taking me somewhere I, could, I just felt it I could just I could see where it could happen, where it could go, if I just stuck at it and I just keep doing what I, what I was doing. And so that became, from that moment on, it was my mission. It was like, all right, I'm only going to sing conscious lyrics about positive things. I'm only going to project conscious good vibes. I'm going to keep making fat, heavy breaks with fat, heavy bass lines. And people really respond to the organicness and vibe that I, I create with all this looping and stuff. But at the end of the day, the technology, it's not really about the technology, it's about putting the soul into it, which is what I'm trying to really express, you know, putting your soul into it. I just happen to have a cool gimmick with all these pedals and <laughs> make it a little bit more interesting compared to the, youth, the next guy. So yeah, after that, uh, is that sort of, from Ukraine, it kind of blew up all around Eastern Europe, Russia, uh, Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, Slovakia, Czech Republic. These are, that's actually my biggest market in the whole world mm. is Eastern Europe. You know, um, I, in Australia, I don't pull more than five, six hundred people to a show. You know, uh, in the, in, I just played uh, a festival, well, we just did some huge festivals over in the UK. I can pull about two thousand people to a show in Hungary by myself. On the so yeah, that's it. That's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's all about finding your market and going and just exploiting it, but in the, in the positive way that you can, you know, and that sort of what I've been doing. I'm always trying to try up new ways of how to take my music to the next level, like trying to break it in America and all that stuff. But every time we try, it's almost like we're taking a step back because you got to let it happen organically and let it, it's all about the people, let the people spread your music. When someone comes up to you and says, you've got to hear this band, you've got to listen to what they're saying as opposed to when the TV tells you, listen to this band because they're so desensitized. So I'm just letting it come, take, I'm taking it as it comes. I take every opportunity I can to speak to people like yourselves and to try and connect with as many people because that's where I truly believe, you know, the, the seeds are planted and all that stuff. So if you want, I can make a little bit of music and show yeah. you guys. Yeah. yeah! Unfortunately, my pedals, actual pedals, are in Toronto Airport. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> It's been like five days now that I have <laughs> my suitcase and oh, my pedals. So they're the best for that. Yeah, they are, aren't they? They're now. They're really good at it. So these are my pedals. So it's kind of a bit sketchy. I've kind of had to reprogram them all really badly, and so it's not going to sound the way it normally would. And uh, oh, yeah. no. And another thing, also, I should say, if anyone, anyone out there thinking of being a street performer in any way, you, good work, you, yeah. Okay, well, awesome. Street performing is the best way get good at what you do. Because like I said earlier, like I learned all this stuff about music and I knew what I wanted to do and what I was capable of. But you know, when you go out street performing it really chisels the fat and it takes away, it cuts you down to what your raw essence is. And that's what street performing did for me. Uh, one of the main things I see a lot of people do is like you rock up to these venues and they, they're gonna have their show, they're gonna put on their band and they're gonna do the show for the people and they rock up with like shit loads of gear. Just way too much gear, like it's, it's to fit on stage. And I always think to myself, would you take that into the street? Would you go street performing with that give my amount of gear? No, you wouldn't. So <laughs> I'm always, it's all about streamlining. Do as, li as little as you can to get the biggest sound possible. 
this is a really crap example because look at all the leads everywhere. This is not how I normally would street perform. All my stuff is set up, ready to go. So literally, I just open my bag, I put down this thing, everything's plugged in, I literally take a lead, plug into the sound system, and another lead to plug in the power, and I'm ready to go. I can set it up in under a minute, and I can be ready to go. <laughs> it's just it's just being clever about it, you know what I'm saying? And so that's I think everyone should do that, especially on tour. You, has anyone heard of Beardy Man? Oh, yeah. 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 I love that guy. He's amazing at what he does. He carries way too much gear. I was having a chat with him, I was having a chat with him and he was saying to me, yeah, like he was talking we were talking about like the cost of, you know, touring around. I'm like, what are you talking about? He's like, Yeah, that's like all the excess baggage and all this and all that. I'm like, what are you talking about? He carries like 120 kilograms of gear. Ooh. Alone, he goes and does his shows. I, um, I've got two bags which are uh, 20 kilos each. One of them I put under my name, one under Kay's name, and that's it. We just, just under the baggage weight, and we rock up to a venue. We can plug it in with under in a minute and a half and smash it. So anyway, that's the thing you should really think about: making it streamlined and as good as you can. All right. So I want to say a couple of things as well before I start. Beatboxing is not my greatest skill. I know how to make you think I'm good at beatboxing. I think that's what all the musicians are all about, is making you believe that you're way better than you really are. It's the illusion, the artistry of it. I truly believe that. So when I was learning to beatbox in school, we used to go like, I used to go, which developed into to like, now, if you beatbox that loud into a microphone, it sounds terrible. <laughs> because the amount of air that you're pushing, uh, I'm pushing through my lips to go into that microphone, it sounds great like, <coughs> acoustically, but when you go into a microphone, it just sounds like <laughs> <laughs> So I have to learn how to make my beatbox sound like that, but through a microphone into the pedal. So using EQ and compression and reverb, I managed to sculpt out all the frequencies, the air frequency that make your beatboxing sound really muddled and confused if you beatbox is around 500 hertz. If you take 500 hertz out of the mix of a kick drum generally, that'll open up loads of room for the bass to sit and the vocals to sit. It's an old technique and I started doing it with my beatboxing and it makes it sound way better. So if I take the EQ off, listen to this. Sounds kind of crap, right? Yeah, turn up, turn the EQ on. It's still not the greatest example, but yeah, anyway. So there, yeah, beatboxing is all about cheating. <laughs> so what I do, uh, I'm going to make a loop now. What I do is uh, I'm going to make a beat. Uh, the first thing I always make is the beat, because if I start with something for, uh, something else and then have to make the beat around that, you can easily train wreck. I do it sometimes, and I know other beatboxers do it perfect every time, but my focus when I perform live is to make people dance and to make people groove and sit in there. So I'm not, I'm not trying to impress them with all my tricks and all the, the crazy sounds that I can do, although I can do great, loads of crazy sounds with these effects. I just want people to dance and just feel the music. So the first thing I do is a beat as quick as I can like this. <laughs> Music is all about elements as well, right? So when I make my beat music, I always have my beat that's punching through the middle and the kick and the snare coming through. I also like to have some layer up the top, some harmony, so that when you take it away, there's a gap in the music, and then when you bring it back in, it sounds full again. So I do that by using loads of reverbs and chorus and delays and making this sound. <laughs> Sound wave, which sounds like this. 
or I can also do another one, which is an octave on my voice to make it sound like this. Alright, and then to get one more layer to the bass so that I can actually fill it out even more. I'll use a synth like this. Right, so now all my elements are there. I can now just make, I can just have fun with the music. So I, I, I kind of picture it in my mind that I've got a drummer, I've got a keyboard player, I've got a bass player, I've got two bass players kind of thing. And then I can just sort of, and I've got my voice as well, which is actually what the whole performance is about. Because I, make, I can make what I just made then in under a minute. It's not about them, what I've just made, it's about the conviction and the lyrics and the things that I put over the top. And a lot of, a lot of beatboxers and performers don't realise that they emphasise too much on the tricks and they're trying to show you, look what I just did! <laughs> But it's just a loop. It's never going to not be a loop. It's always going to be that same loop over and over again. So you need to sing over the top. Open your heart now, let it lose you. Music that moves you, music that moves you. Close your eyes, I wanna lose you. Here is a message, you won't confuse you. Open your heart now, and let it lose you. Music that moves you, music that moves you. Close your eyes, I wanna lose you. Here is a message, you won't confuse you. Open your heart now, let it lose you. That music that moves you, music that moves you. Close your eyes, I wanna lose you. Here is a message, I wanna lose you. So as I'm feeling the rhythm on my lips Get the effects of the mix Move hips through the mix of the funky beatbox kicks This is my brain Shout it again Yes, I'm in a brain I'm your groove to the soul train I let me take you back in time To the old school Remember the days Smoking splits every day Coming up in new ways I had a place Before school Now I'm just another fool Trying to survive on my 9 to 5 I realize the dream With my own eyes I'll be taking it in the street Bust the price Redefine lies Inside my mind Trying to find the way you're alive Cause I'll be ripping up hands Living a bang, giving it off on my own emotion You hear me crashing on the earth like the ocean My poetry's like the magic in the potion Your energy's one degrees in my devotion I want some hip hop and just don't stop Bring it on the rhythm, the bass won't drop Fever on the floor, we'll make your body rock The funk won't stop, let's take it to the top I want some hip hop and just don't stop Bring it on the rhythm, the bass won't drop Fever on that floor, we'll make your body rock The funk won't stop
that's, that, that's just messing around, you know what I mean? A lot of the time, uh, what I do is I write a song. I write a song on the acoustic guitar first. That's how a lot of my tunes have been written, actually. And when I, I'm kind of happy with it, and I think, yeah, it sounds good, but it just sounds folky, or it just sounds like something that's been done a hundred times. I take the idea and the concept, the lyrics and the melodies, and I, I sort of go in here and I just sort of mess around, you know what I mean? And I think that's what music should always be about, having fun and just experimenting. And yeah, I kind of, I've told you all my secrets, I think. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything, any questions anyone wants to ask about what I do, how I do? How about all that shit off roughly? I'm about to go get that right now. <laughs> yeah, well, when I started, I had the GT6, which you can get for about $150. And then I had the Akai Headrush pedal, which is a loop station, which only has one loop you can do on it. So you make the first loop, and the first loop that you record, it stores that separately, and then you can build as many loops as you want on top of that, and just go as chaotic as you like, and then wipe it back to the very first loop. So what I used to do is when I'd go out for hours on the street, and that, the thing about that, because when you perform with a band, jazz bands especially, it's all about chords and doing different things and harmonies over different chords and moving things around. When you're stuck with one loop, you know, it's, it's all just, you just got to find it one note. You can just learn how to groove over one note, and you can groove over any note, you know what I mean? So I'd make a beat. The first thing I'd do is I'd just make a beat, and then I would make a bass line over that beat, and sing and rap, and then just, just build it up with my voice, and then slowly add another loop, a uh, harmony, and then kind of sing and dance, or like a beatbox around that, so I'd sorry, rap and sing around that, not dance. <laughs> and uh, then slowly build things up and to the point where it was, it was just too much, there was not enough space anymore. And then I could literally wipe everything back to the original beat and start a new bass line in a completely new key. Mm. So I would show you like 10 minutes, like I'd do like a hip hop beat and spend like 35, 40 minutes on a hip hop beat going through as many different keys and as different ideas as I could just around that one beat and just trying to be as creative as I could. And then once I'm sick of that hip hop beat, then I'd switch it up to a reggae beat or do a dubstep beat, or do a drum and bass beat, and I'll just be able to do like hours and hours of just entertaining myself, basically, <laughs> on the street. And that's what people kind of really connected to, so yeah. So the, the original setup, coming back to your question, would have cost me about 300 bucks all up. Over time, as I made more money on the street and I wanted to explore more possibilities, I, <coughs> I got to the sort of the highest level of what you can get. What you can get. This, I think, I don't, this has just come out. I think they're about four or five hundred bucks, and these are about four or five hundred bucks. Show it to us. Sorry, yeah, this is the uh, RC505, the new loop station by Boss Weldon. <laughs> yeah, no, they're, they're, they're really good to me. They gave me new stuff all the time, actually, nowadays, because they realize that I've got more hits on their videos than they have. <laughs> and using their equipment. So yeah, this is a new loop stage. It's pretty sweet. You've got five uh, loops you can run, but you have to use your fingers. You can't use it with your feet, which is kind of annoying if you're a guitarist or, you know what I mean? But um, I kind of enjoy it. I'm so sick of doing everything with my feet. Although I got really good at it and I can I sort of dance in about and sort of make it all happen. Uh, it, I just got so bored after like six years of doing the same thing. So now it's wicked. I get to plan out new things. So yeah, so that's, yeah, it's about a grand all together for this stuff. Um, I've got a two part question. I wanted to hear you to, uh, elaborate a little uh, more on the 500 hertz and that trick of opening up space in the drum beat. And I also wanted to hear your thoughts on, have you seen that TED Talk with Imogen Heap? Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that one. Mm -hmm. she's got, well, she's got a TED Talk and she's built all this gear and she runs it off of a, one of those new Playstations. And she'd say where she steps in the stage. I've heard she about this. Different, you should, you should really do different things with the sound and yeah. So I'd really like to oh, see yeah. perhaps with some custom gear where you just where you're literally just moving and where you move in the grid changes uh, what sort of soundscape you enter. It's really <laughs> fascinating next level stuff. So it is. Uh, Twister. I'd, I'd really like to hear your okay, so thoughts <laughs> on uh, <laughs> that person that opening that space inside the drum and suddenly. Well, as you get anyone here doing production, music production courses and things like that, of course. Or just production in general. Yeah, yeah, people, this guy. Well, if, if you know anyone who does that stuff realizes that you know music, when you record music, which is what I'm essentially doing on the fly, it's like it's you know five channel sort of recording thing. Um, when you're recording music, it's all about space and EQing is the, the first thing that they had back in the day in order to create that space. When they started, they only had two frequency bands they could choose, but 525, 525 hertz was the very center, and that's where either they would boost it, or they would uh, bring it down, or they would boost it and bring it down, and so they would kind of go like that, or depending on 
how they, that's all they had with sound back in the day when they first started. And then they started learning how to cut things off. In fact, the Jamaicans, you know, King Tubby, oh. had a lot of influence over that stuff. And um, he, he would buy things like reverb units and then open them up and change them around and add extra EQ thing. He was a proper nutter. Um, Lee Perry too. Lee Perry as well, definitely. King Tubby was more than it, like a, a, a scientist geek. Tinker. So, yeah, tinkerer, tinkerer, yeah, exactly. So, you know, EQing is like the most important thing about recording music, otherwise everything kind of, unless you've got amazing musicians who already know how to make their, like they can get together in a room and they can change the way that they play their instrument to suit the frequencies of all the other people in the band. That's a lot, that's a real jazz thing. There's a lot of jazz musicians who are really good at that. They can just sound great in any combination, any situation, then you just put a, a bunch of mics in front of them and it sounds <laughs> but if you're doing something heavier and fatter and or you're trying to do something new and different and you just want to experiment, then EQ and compression and reverb is the most important thing. So for beatboxing, um, my EQ chain, the way my EQ looks on my beatbox channel. So just, um, just to be naive, what is, that, what is EQ? Is it just an equalizer? Or equalizer, yeah. yeah, sorry. So frequencies, you've got all your frequencies, you've got the bottom well, from your direction, bottom end down here and the top end up here. Uh, the lowest frequency we can hear is 20 hertz, around about 20,000 is the highest frequency we can hear. Uh, animals can hear higher. Can you, can you play music on your speakers lower than the audible human ear frequency? It doesn't affect people? There's no point because speakers can't recreate the frequencies below 20 hertz usually. This band system probably can't even go below 30 it, really. Is it possible? Yeah, okay, so it all comes down to this. this like, if you want to go in there, I can to explain. Well, basically, also, the way speakers represent uh, full out frequencies is. The different speeds at which a speaker can move can create different uh, frequencies. So, of the higher the frequency, the much faster a speaker has to move. Which is why tweeters are really small, and why you know little headphones sound really tinny and crap is because they can only go so fast. Whereas a big sub is big because it's got a big thing that sort of moves slowly and pulses the music. They've made speakers to answer your question that go below 20 hertz. The one that goes down to like 17 or 18. It's like the valve sound system in the UK. They're proper sound boys, oh. and they um, they made it. They've actually had to because they're called drivers, right? The uh, the speaker is called a driver. They've actually had to mechanically create a engine that pushes the speaker so that it can go slow enough oh, yeah. and equal enough to create a low enough frequency and it can go so low basically that you can actually shit yourself. <laughs> Pretty crazy. The, the brown note is like 12 hertz I think. <laughs> so anyway, so but when you get, I've, I've heard the valve sound system and it didn't make me poo myself, no, but I did, there was this one thing where they, they dropped, the, the, the DJ just dropped everything and all of a sudden I couldn't hear any music but I could just feel it, that's all. It was just my chest was pounding. I'm just, <laughs> but at the end of the day, it's just a party trick, really. I mean, it's not about, you know, music's not about tricks. It's about just performance and giving the best possible performance. So, in, in, you know, in terms of the question, 500 hertz is just something that works for me. Yes. Other beatboxes, when I do that, take that frequency out of them. They're so good at beatboxing and sounding great when they just get a normal crappy sound system or whatever, you know, cut anywhere. They just get a mic and they can just sound like an old break, a funk break, or they can do the bass and um, I can't do that stuff. I've never been able to do that stuff. I know that was never my goal was to be able to do that. So when I take that frequency out of them, it doesn't work. I do it, but they, they making all the elements at once in their sound. I just want to make a kick, a hi-hat, and a snare. And in order to make that sound as punchy and as clean and clear as possible, I've got to take out certain frequencies. So I roll off the top end so that there's not really glassy top end coming through because hats don't really have that much top end in them anyway, high hats. And uh, yeah, mid-range, so the, between the kick and the snare drum there's a little bit of a gap and that's where your voice, like around 500 hertz, is where your voice generally sounds warm and nice and also the bass frequencies want to sit between 500 down to about 200. Um, so, I mean, you know, I'm, as you can tell, I'm a huge geek when it comes to like, production, that's my thing. That's actually more so than I would really get to call myself a singer, I reckon I'm more of a producer, actually, which is what I do live at the moment. I just learn how to make it look like that's it. Yes. What tip would you use in the studio? What do I use in the studio? I use Cubase. That's my program of choice. I know Ableton is like a huge one and a lot of people love that. I grew up with Cubase and I'm good at it. On the Atari or? Uh, <laughs> no, bro. Um, 
Uh, I'm not that old, thank you. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, I just got a laptop, a uh, MacBook Pro, and I'm just running a few based on that. And um, I plug my pedal into that. I've got a bunch of outboard gear. I've got some uh, really nice uh, outboard compressors and a tube vitalizer. I've got a, mi out, uh, a summing mixer. So um, yeah, but for me, like the thing about recording music, and this is the thing a lot of people, I got sucked into this game, is people, they, they get so reliant on their tricks and on their equipment and on plugins. When, you, when you're a producer, like you can get the latest compressor and the latest EQ and the latest this and that and make it sound, try and sound like really good, but really actually the best performance is all that really matters because no matter how much EQ and compression you slap on a performance, performance that big resonates with people anyway. And the more you, you cover that up, the crap it's gonna sound. And that's what I did for a lot of my albums to begin with, was I was trying too hard to put too many sounds in and not leave any space and squeeze every little sound I could put into every little bit of the music of the song, everything just full. And now when I listen back to my records, I can't listen to them because it's like there's no space and there's no there's no soul for me. But I can't live with my own. Anyway, yeah. Um. What's the most important musical skill to uh, making good music? Most important musical skill? Yeah. No ego. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah that, that's the one thing that I know because I know guys that have got way better voices than me. They sing better than me. They, they write better music. They can rap better than me. They can, they, their albums are better than mine. But they've got the worst ego complexes and they're broke. They are, really. Broke, yeah. Proper broke, like in every possible meaning of that word. <laughs> so, you know, nothing comes of that stuff. But on a literal, small term, I don't know, man. I just think practicing and being open minded and flexible is the best thing you can do. But now, if I went out in the street and street performed and just thought, this is what I'm going to do, if you don't like it, then screw you on that. Then I wouldn't be here right now. You know, I, 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 when I was in Italy, Italians <coughs> love reggae music. They love melodic Ooh. reggae music. So I just did loads of reggae when I was in Italy. When I went to the UK, they're beyond that. The reggae, you know, some white kid playing reggae. Oh, yeah. There's heaps of Jamaicans there that play way better already. The Caribbean <laughs> community in the UK is huge. So it's like, I was like, okay, well, I still, that's my sound, that's where I started. But I, they, I was listening to what was coming out of the cars when I was walking down the street. I was listening to grime and jungle and drum and bass and dubstep. And these sounds I'd never even heard before before I got to the UK. So I just immersed myself in that world and just sort of learned as much as I could. The first day I went street performing in Manchester, I set my gear up and I started making a beat and this kid stops going, nah, 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 man. He's like, play the other beat, the other beat you were playing before. And he's like, what? He's like, not the one you're doing before. I'm like, and I made the beat again. He's like, yeah, 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 cool. Now make a bass. It's like, wah, wah. <laughs> no kidding. No, it's actually happening. It's literally making it like this. Is all. I'm just like, you do it. And he's like, okay. And he grabs it. He's like, wah, 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 wah. And I'm into it. And then he just, and he starts to loop. And then he just looks at me and he just started freestyling. And like, it was awesome. <laughs> and I was just like, and all of a sudden, a crowd of people started like gathering. And I was like, okay. And the next thing, this other kid comes like, can I jump on the mic? Can I jump on the mic? I'm like, yeah. And he grabs it and he starts going, beep, 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 Super fast. And I'm just like, okay, everyone can MC in this country. And I'd be like, and there was a queue, literally. It's like in Manchester, especially. I remember at one point looking at my mic and there was just hands down the cord. <laughs> and like as soon as one guy would finish rapping, he'd let go and then someone else would finish rapping. <laughs> I just went on back for hours on the street. Just sat there, just like playing with my pedals, watching and just like listening. I mean, I know other people who would have been scared by the other thing. And like, oh, they're going to take my gear. No, 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 no. But I was just like, let's do it. Let's, let's have a party. You know what I mean? And every day I went out there and I learned off these kids and just. They taught me everything about what I know now. Like, as, you know, and so that's all about being flexible and learning as much as you can. And having the ego because you're not all upset by being good with their No ego. Yeah. You're just one skill. Like setting the. You go. You shy. Making all that. Exactly. It's just. Mm -hmm. open. I mean, you're in the street. You've put yourself in the position to have your shit ready, like stolen off you. You know, you've got to expect that that's going to happen. So as long as you have an open heart and a more like, you know, positive vibe about you, then... How, how many times have you guys been stolen from? Right, my stuff been stolen? Yeah, I've never had my gear stolen off me. 
I've had jumpers and sunglasses and things that I've left around my gear stolen off me. Yeah. Except for Air Canada. Borrowed. Every time I try to learn a production, I always wind up stuff. Uh, I find myself staring at the DJs of hertz or frequencies, and my eyes are just melting from the dark. Where would you recommend starting to learn about production? It's so many accessible things, I can't. Well, you won't learn anything until you do it, right? So just playing with it and fiddling about. I mean, when I started, I was like you. I had no idea. And I all these frequencies, I'm like, oh, what? But then the more I did it and the more I applied what I would learn into, you know, I read a lot of magazines like Future Music, SOS. I, I, every airplane I buy three of those magazines and I go scan through them and I read up in gear and I learn about what that gear does. Even if they're talking about a thing you can do in Logic or in Ableton, I'll read that article because I might, I might learn something that I can apply to Cubase. So I'm constantly just immersing myself in that world. But, you know, it'll, it just comes with time, like anything. You just you keep just playing around with it and we'll get better. Thanks. Yep. What's some of the new stuff you're experimenting with, maybe genre-wise, or new weird sounds? New weird sounds? I am stuck in the 90s, bro. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I think that was like, it's my, my favorite sort of era for kind of dance culture and just the best hip hop was in the 90s. Oh, the best yeah. drum and bass and jungle was in the 90s. Oh, yeah. um, you know, Maybe not like reggae and stuff, but you know, that was just, it was so much soul, even grunge and rock and all that was killing it back then. These days everything's just kind of all about how to just make a product and it's not about the artistry anymore. So as far as new sounds and stuff goes, I kind of draw influences from the past all the time. I'm all about nostalgia. Everything I do, I try to put music, because that's what music is anyway. And music is just people's interpretation of something they've already heard. And the more you try and cover that up, um, then I guess the more you're kind of going against what you really like. So you try, I just kind of, I, I really love certain bass lines in Jamaican music, and in Jamaica there's no copyright on bass lines. The slang tang rhythm, which is that bass line, that's been recorded like two and a half thousand yeah. times in Jamaica alone. <laughs> different record labels, different artists, no one's ever paid a cent to anyone for it. That's just in Jamaica. I've ripped that bass line off. I've, that's on the Ferry album. And it's just, it's all about recycling. Music is all about recycling and just putting your own spin on it. Don't reinvent the wheel, add to it. Right? <laughs>